She had a heart for Uganda and later adopted 13 girls. New York Times best-selling author Katie Davis Majors joins us to discuss finding hope in the midst of trials. Plus, Ephraim Graham is back with this week's top five stories from the world of entertainment. All that and more on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Here's a look at this week's top five from Studio Five. I was in the snowbank for five hours. At number five, farewell to a family-friendly favorite. Everyone say something nobody else knows that you feel bad about, but you'll feel better after you say it. I use dad's toothbrush. What? Not in my mouth. The Middle returns to start its final season. The mom at the center of it all, Patricia Heaton, tells me what she'll miss most about the sitcom. Like when you're on the set, if you just put your hand out like this, someone will give you water or Twizzlers. And you know, I go home in my house, I put my hand out, nothing happens. At number four. Come on, quit resisting you. Where are we going? You like a mule. With the sixth and final There's season a... of the Mary There's Mary one. reality I series to drawing to a close. Some say it's too to forgive. I say it's too hard not to. The Tina Campbell half of the duo is embarking on a 20-city solo tour. Now, the new project is called It's Still Personal. Yes. So is it still personal? Man, let me tell you something. The relationship with God. Man, I'm so, I'm so God-possessed, it ain't even funny. I mean, it's so funny that I, I was like the face of gospel with my sister with Mary mm -hmm. Mary for countless years. Yeah. And the truth is, I, my relationship with God was not as personal as it is now. At number three. I can only imagine. The story behind be that wildly alive. popular Bart Millard song when is now a major motion picture. It's an amazing song. It just kind of happened. It took about 10 minutes, I guess. It didn't take you 10 minutes to write this. It took a lifetime. And this week, Studio 5 got a sneak peek at the Irwin Brothers film, starring Dennis Quaid. And he said, uh, I've never played transformation on film like this before, ever, in my life, you know? And, uh, and can people really change like this? Like, does this really, did this really happen? When I was uh, 10, 11 years old, life was tough. And I found some songs that I just, man, I, I held on to. And they got me through. They gave me hope. Because I needed it. Maybe tonight, so do you. The film hits theaters in March. At number two, hip hop legend MC Light answers a sometimes vulgar viral challenge, rapping praises about our faith in God. I came out of sin for the Lord. Yeah, but they just every now and then for the Lord, huh? Mm -hmm. I'm flying fresh to death for the Lord. Yeah, know? but you ain't dead. You just waiting on the Lord, right? <laughs> Hashtag for the D is a social viral craze that has some celebrities revealing outlandish things they would do for sex. Since two, I've been checking for the Lord. What? I stand on the mountain for the Lord. Oh, what? yes. Set God in the for, for the Lord. Lord. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! <laughs> At number one. What in the world? Hang on a second. Who are you? That's Pluto. That's our new stray dog. The Stray is the true life story of a dog saving an entire family. This isn't working anymore. You working at the studio day and night. What about our dreams? My dream is a happy family. We're not doing so well. At what point as you're living this phase of your life, did you realize, I've got a movie? You know, I never really realized that until two years ago, our youngest son came to my wife and I and said, hey, I've been thinking, I wanna make a movie out of the Pluto lightning story. And my wife and I were like, what? It was kind of a private story, kind of a sacred family story that got passed down and. Our youngest was the only one of our five children who was not alive when it happened. The Strike is in American Theaters Friday. Well, Ephraim Graham is here, and let's just lead off with the number one, The Stray. The Stray. Do you think it's going to be a hit? I hope people see it, and that's why one of the reasons I'm sharing it. Uh, it is a very well-done film, and it is based on a true story. Um, so 
I think it's beautiful. My prayer is that people will go out and see it and support it um, because you hear it's the stray. It is literally about a stray dog, but it's how this stray dog came into this family's life and literally saved it. I mean, I truly have to seeing this film believe God orchestrated that dog coming into their lives and transforming it. This is a real Hollywood executive who was his life was so busy. He wasn't taking care of his family. And the dog helped him to realize, you're on the wrong path, son. And I think it's beautifully told. Um, and I'm glad I got a chance to see it before it hit theaters. I'll be taking my daughter to see it. So I will, I'll be in that number. And I hope like other people see it. It's really well done. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can only imagine uh, another now a movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what do you think? I took my daughter to see it. And mm-hmm. there was a screening this week. And I was enjoying it. I was wo- concerned about whether or not she was going to like it. She's only nine years old. And I looked over, and my daughter was crying. And I said, this is a good film. If you can keep the attention of a nine-year-old talking about the story behind a song, it's so well done. The Irwin brothers say that this is their best film. Mm. I would agree. I've seen, I think, all of their films. This is really an emotionally gripping film. They've now become a brand. <laughs> yes, I mean, yes, the Irwin you know, Brothers. You know, <laughs> Irwin Brothers Productions. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, you got it. They're, they're a studio in the making. They are. They are. Great, great film. Um, I can't wait for people to see it in March. Uh, it was a rough cut that we saw. Uh, minor changes they'll need to make, but it's beautifully done. Well, that's encouraged. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Because that's quite a song. It is. And I had no idea Amy Grant's connection to the song, Michael W. Smith's connection to the song, and the story behind it. I mean, his father, Jesus Christ, transformed his father. This is not the same man we meet at the start of the film and the end of the film. Uh, and the Irwin Brothers do a good job of telling that story. All right. Mary Mary is closing, mm-hmm. which... Why? Final season. <laughs> Final season. They both said it was time. Um, uh, the beautiful thing about Tina Campbell's story is uh, she lived her drama on that reality series. She learned while filming the reality series that her husband was cheating um, and chose not to stop the cameras, but allowed them to watch this play out in her life. This was the last season. It was among the highest rated seasons for them. And this season is looking to do even better. Uh, In talking to her, she said, essentially, you know, I had to decide that I was going to forgive. But I have to say, working through this with my husband, I am now closer to God than I ever have been. Mm -hmm. And realized that my relationship with God, you know, not only was I having problems with my relationship with my husband, but part of it was my relationship with God wasn't what it should have been even while I'm making a name for myself as a gospel singer, that it wasn't there. Uh, So we see that play out in the last season. And this season we see, you know, their relationship blossom. But she's now embarking on a solo tour. uh, And I think it speaks volumes and encouragement to all of us as believers who struggle with difficulty. um, I think that's why it's so popular, Mm -hmm. that it's not trying to gloss it over. It's not trying to hide it. It's saying, here I am, warts and all. Mm -hmm. And even though I've made a decision for Christ, yes. life is still happening. <laughs> yes, life still happens. And, you know, how do I walk it out when life still happens? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and when life happens, people around you, people very close to you can make some very serious mistakes. And what do you do with that? Absolutely. What do you do with it? Uh, she said to me, she said, you know, I know it was the Holy Spirit because had I known you know, when I said, okay, let the cameras continue to roll, that it was actually going to get worse before it got better, mm-hmm. I probably would have said, you would have backed off. I would have backed right. off. She goes, but it was the Holy Spirit that said, let it go. And, and she did. And, and I think it blessed many people. I think in many ways, it's easier to, to be transparent about your own failings, but mm-hmm. your reaction to other people, mm-hmm. um, it, it's harder. It's hard. Yeah, indeed. Indeed it is. It is. How and do it's you harder to say, on a continual basis, I forgive. I choose to forgive. You got to choose, choose to love, and you have to choose to forgive. And sometimes you have to choose every day. <laughs> yes, you do. And it's a daily thing. Sometimes you choose multiple times a day. <laughs> I agree. And sometimes it gets into seventy times seventy times seventy, <laughs> and you know where do you go with that? Yeah, the Bible is real. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And and the shows, but for for her solo career now, what do you think? Um, I told her the first time I heard that song that that. Um, is there. It's called uh, It's Too Hard Not To, and it's saying it's too hard not to forgive. The first time I heard it on the radio, I didn't even realize it was her. I said, gee, hmm. what a beautiful voice, so pure. And then when it got to the end, I was like, that's Tina Campbell. Like, 
Oh, wow. Uh, powerful voice, beautiful. She wrote that song herself as well. Um, I don't think she's going to have a problem um, <laughs> staying in the music <laughs> business with her sister or without her sister. That Mary Mary is still intact. They're just both yeah. doing solo things, but they are not splitting at all. Um, but her solo career, I think this is her second solo album. I can't, I can't imagine it not doing well. A star is born again. Get it? You got that. I like that. A star is indeed born again. <laughs> well, the middle. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been on nine years. I know, nine uh, years. And now they're rapping. They're, they're, they're rapping. Um, the good news is I think I read this week that uh, it's now also available on Hulu. So you can go back and watch all nine seasons. So you, you're not going to have to miss them too much. Um, but it's been a good run. And it's a very uh, well done family show. My kids and I watch it together. And we we, we have a good laugh uh, every week, so I'm glad it's back. Watched it last night, as a matter of fact. Yeah. I like the tease, and maybe I need to try that on set. I'll just hold up my hand. <laughs> and somebody bring yes. me Twizzlers. And water. And, and we're going to wait. We're going to wait. And so, I think we're going to wait a yeah, long time. Wait a while. <laughs> I don't think it's going to happen. No. <laughs> well, for all the latest in entertainment news, check out Ephraim's weekly show, Studio 5. It's available on Roku, Apple TV, or watch it online at CBN.com slash Studio 5. And Ephraim, we'll see you next week. I'll be here. Thank you. Well, coming up, helping people all over the world. Find out why this couple says they're giving, but getting more in return right after this. Jim and Donna Nellius stay busy traveling the country for business. And at the same time, they're taking the gospel to children all around the world by supporting CBN's animated program, Superbook. As retirement community managers, Jim and Don and Elias don't stay in one place for long. They travel the country, filling in for other managers on vacation. Even with all the moving around, some things stay consistent, like tithing to their church and giving to CBN. Wherever we go when we work, we go to different churches, uh, and we always want to give to that church because I believe there's a principle there. But then there's tithes and offerings. We're to give to, the, to evangelism, reaching others that need Christ. We're to give to the poor. We're to give to the orphans. And, and CBN has ministries to every one of those areas. So when we give to them, they diversify that money and, and it goes right where I believe it should be given. They help so many people. It's all over the world. Mm. It's not just one small group of people. It's, it's worldwide and there's just an unending array of people that have helped through that giving and I just feel blessed to be part of it. As grandparents, they especially love supporting Superbook. It's one way they can share their faith with their grandson, Jacob, no matter where they are. The last time we were together, he talked about the Superbook and the, ca the cartoons and the different things. We just see God using the Superbook to bring that whole family, you know, my daughter and her husband and, of course, little Jacob, closer to where they need to be they also see the bigger picture. I love Superbook because I know it's gonna affect little children and those little children are gonna affect their parents and I know that it's gonna make a difference in so many children's lives. Jim and Donna see their giving as part of God's plan for reaching the world and pouring His blessings on their lives. If we give to God, He's going to give back to us because He loves us. Mm. He's our Father. I feel like right now, just the, it's like, a, like having no weight whatsoever on my shoulders. I feel so free. It's not even funny because of the just faithfulness of God and applying His principles and how that really makes all the difference. Giving can make all the difference. Uh, it's more blessed to give than receive. Uh, and when you do that, amazing things start to happen. When you get part of God's plan to say, I'm going to give up my dreams, uh, my ambitions, I want to be part of God's plan, uh, then suddenly wonderful things can start to happen to you. All you have to do is be obedient to what He's telling you to do. And if you want to be a part of sending the stories of the Bible to the children of the world, all you have to do is call us and say, I want to join the Superbook DVD Club. Uh, for a gift of $25 or more, we'll send you the latest uh, collection of episodes. It's Superbook Explorer, and it's got the story of Job and the story of the Good Samaritan in it. So if you'd like that, just call us, 1-800-700-7000, and say, yes, I want to join the Superbook DVD Club. 
Well, up next, from America to Uganda, she's a New York Times best-selling author. She's also a missionary and a founder of a wonderful organization. Katie Davis Majors is daring to hope, and she joins us in the studio. Don't go away. Well, becoming a missionary, then leaving everything behind for the sake of the gospel, well, that's a big step for anyone. Well, Katie was just 18 years old when she visited Uganda and had an experience that would change her life and the lives of those around her. Katie Davis Majors always dreamed of having a few kids and a house with a white picket fence. But when she moved to Uganda 10 years ago, Katie fell in love with and adopted 13 girls. After the biological mother of one of her long-term foster daughters showed up to claim her, life as Katie had known it ceased to exist. In her book, Daring to Hope, Katie shares how she chose faith in the midst of her circumstances and what she encountered in the least expected places. Well, Katie Davis Major joins us now. And Katie, you're one of my heroes. I think the world of you. I think it's awesome, your story. Thank you. I want to catch the viewers up real quickly on it. You were uh, head of your class in high school. You could have picked any college in the nation. Uh, you were 18. You said, no, I'm not going to follow the American dream. Yeah. I'm going to follow God's dream. Yeah. I'm going to go to Uganda. Um, and then you wrote a book about it. Yes. Um, Kisses from Katie. It became a New York Times bestseller, which is just awesome. <laughs> Surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> um, looking back, here we are 10 years later. Look, looking back, um, what do you think of 18-year-old Katie? Oh, yeah. I mean, I admire her a little bit, just this, this willingness to just go and just do and just love people, you know, without caring really hmm. what was expected or what other people thought or what I could and should do. But I also think um, I was very optimistic, you know, just that everything would always go well. And I think in the last 10 years, God has really showed me who he is, even when things don't go well and even when there isn't this really optimistic, happy ending. If you knew things weren't going to go well, would you still have done it? I think so. Uh, I, I'm usually up for a challenge, but it's been much harder than I originally anticipated. And mm -hmm. at the same time, God has shown himself to me so much more than I could have ever imagined. Well, let's talk about one of, uh, one of the things that didn't go well, mm -hmm. where you lost one of your adopted daughters, Jane. Yes. Um, what, what happened? Yeah, Jane was um, a long-term foster child, and we had fostered other children kind of short-term in interim placements, intending to put them back with their families. But Jane, we were all set to adopt. We hadn't been able to find any family for her to go live with. She'd been completely abandoned, and so it was very shocking when after having her for three years, her biological mother showed up and wanted her back. Um, and part of my heart thought, okay, this is good. This is birth family. Yeah. This is what our ministry this is, is about, right? But at the same time, I'm thinking, no, she's mine in my heart. Mm. She'd become my child. And so I was devastated and our family was devastated. And at four years old, I was really the only mother she had ever known. So it was also watching her walk through confusion and hardship as well. And I, I cried out to God, you know, please to not let it be this way. And truth be told, he did not answer that prayer in the way that I selfishly wanted him to. But he was near to me and his presence was real and his goodness was real to me, even in the midst of our hardship. What did you do with that? When, when prayers go unanswered, where you start saying, God, you're not running the universe right today. <laughs> I'm, I'm having problems here. What, where did you go with that? Yeah, we, we start to say to God, okay, God, this isn't my idea of good, right? You, you say that you're good, but I'm not seeing it right now. And there were a couple of things that really helped me in that time. One was just the practice of gratitude. I, I began to kind of list down and think about Okay, what has God given me that is God good? What do I see that is good? And, and as I did that, I realized that my blessings, the things that God had done for me, far outweighed my hardship and that 
you know, there's, there's no way to be angry with God when we're looking around and recounting back to Him all the things that we're thankful for. And I found so much comfort in Scripture. I felt like um, even David, you know, he can cry out to the Lord honestly and say, this is what I like and this is what I don't like. And I felt like God was okay with that. Like He could take my honesty and He, he wanted to comfort me in the midst of my hurt. Well, I think that's one of the keys to your book, Daring to Hope. Yeah is, uh, you know, you, you, not, you don't just, you go through the hardship and, and from a spiritual journey standpoint, uh, describe wh what, it, what, what it takes to get through. Uh, you also had a close friend, Catherine. Uh, what happened there? Catherine was a woman who came to live with us. She was very, very ill and she had five young children. So she came to stay with us so that I could help her with her children who she was too weak to care for at the time. And also because our home is a lot closer to the local hospital than hers was. So she needed to be right there for her treatment. And again, I really believed and trusted that God would heal her. I fully thought that that was his plan and he didn't. We ended up being with her while she died and went to be with Jesus. And um, while wow, that was a very beautiful time, it was also a very difficult time. And I think I felt angry towards him that he had seen me believing that he would heal her and he didn't. Um, but I felt like mm. I could be honest in that. I could bring my sadness. I could bring my anger to him. And he was grieved too. You know, there's so much suffering world over, not just in Uganda. Everybody has their hardships and their suffering. And I think it was just such a comfort to me to know that God saw that and He still loved me and He still wanted to be my comfort. And ultimately, He wants the world to not be like this anymore. One day He will come back and this we won't suffer like this. Did you ever tell God, why did you get me into this? <laughs> I think so. I think I had a lot of questions. I said, no, I can't do this. And no, I don't want to do this. And, you know, I, I felt comfort. I even asked him, you know, why? Why would you pick me? And I, I felt like he gave the answer to my heart that I knew that you would. I, I knew that you would love these people well. Um, and I think mm. he says that to each of us at different times when we say, okay, God, why me? And he says, because I know that you can be faithful to me in this. Wow, that's, a, that's an incredible revelation. Um, have you ever thought, and, and uh, this is a dangerous question to ask, but I'll ask it, would you do it all over again? I would, I would, and it's, you know, there's part of me that it's hard to say that because it has been a hard journey, but to know God intimately the way I know Him now, I wouldn't have experienced certain sides of God and certain parts of His character without the hardship. Mm -hmm. Um, in reading Paul's letters, you see a lot about the mm. fellowship of suffering, yes. and we make up in ourselves what is lacking. It's a very curious verse, what is lacking in the sacrifice of Christ, which I've, I've never really truly understood. But in times where I'm going through it, uh, I, I get a glimpse of it. Yes. it. It's that shared suffering mm -hmm. where you, you find a bond that you don't find any other way. Absolutely, yes. Um, do you get a better sense of why Jesus went to the cross because of what you've gone through? Absolutely. I mean, I think first and foremost, he, you know, he can relate any pain, any suffering that we are going through Jesus himself has already born. He, he understands it. And that is so comforting to me. And also just that when I can't do it, when I feel like I just, I can't do it, he gives us the grace. He gives us the strength because we see that he has the grace and the strength to endure. Um, I've got to ask this and we don't have a lot of time, but uh, you ended up getting married. I did. Yeah. Which congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, did you think you were ever going to marry? I did it. I mean, even sitting here with you six years ago, I had kind of put that notion out of my head and thought that's probably just not something God has for me. You know, here we have this big family. We have this crazy life. Who, who would God bring to enter into it? And he did so faithfully bring just the right patient, loving man. So we've been married almost three years now. Yeah, he took a, it, it took a long time to convince you. Yes, it did. <laughs> I was hesitant. What, what finally got you? I, I just watched Benji and his servant heart and his love for others. He has this true love for the Lord and this true desire to see the gospel go forth to all nations. And of course, I found that so attractive. 
Yay, yay. All right, well, the book is called Daring to Hope. It's available wherever books are sold, and I trust that it will help you on your journey. Here's a word from you from Romans. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you. We'll see you again.